Good morning. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verses 23 through 28. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides, you strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look righteous, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. This is the word of the Lord. A couple of weeks ago, I was reading the news, and I found an article that said, tallest waterfall in China found to be a fraud. And I thought that was a very strange article, so of course I had to click on it to read it. And so I clicked and I learned how a waterfall could be fake. The tallest waterfall in China is a thousand feet tall. I think I have a picture here of it. And uh, for reference, if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, Niagara Falls is 300 feet tall. So this is so much taller than that, three times as tall. It's, a, it's a, really an amazing sight. This waterfall, whose name I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, is visited by millions of people every year. Recently, a hiker said, listen, we have never had a photograph of the top of the waterfall. And so this, this hiker decides to climb 1,000 feet up, to to photograph the source of this beautiful waterfall. But whenever he gets to the top, he did not find a powerful stream cascading down the mountain. Instead, he finds, do I have a picture of this? A pipe. (laughs) A pipe uh, where water was flowing through the pipe to create a waterfall. The hiker posted this on social media, and it created a massive controversy throughout all of China. It turns out that officials had installed the pipe because this waterfall actually dried up every summer. Like whenever it would get warm, whenever the rain would stop, stop falling as much, the waterfall would go away. So they decided that it would be appropriate to create a fake waterfall so that people could enjoy it all year round. And the reality is, as long as people thought the waterfall was real, they enjoyed it. But the moment the truth was revealed, the favorite waterfall in China became the most hated waterfall in China. We experience fake things all the time. I don't know how many of you all are on Facebook, but I have a Facebook account, and I get friend requests all the time from people who are already my friends, right? These are clone accounts, and no offense, if I've accepted you once, I'm not accepting you two or three or four or five times. I get spam phone calls all the time from people trying to sell me fake things. If you find an online deal that is too good to be true, Chances are, it is too good to be true. In college, I was just getting into uh, uh, the hobby of fly fishing, and I decided that to go with my new fly pole, I needed a, a new fishing knife. And so I researched and looked at all of the different things, and I decided I wanted this really nice $100 knife. And I was looking at it, and, and I decided, hey, I'm a college student. I can't really afford a $100 knife. So I went on eBay and began watching eBay for this knife. And eventually, after a few weeks, I saw it. It was the perfect thing. It was exactly what I wanted, and I began bidding on it. And I won the bid for $30, and I was so happy, right? I had saved so much money. The, the knife comes in the mail, and whenever I open it up, I was terribly disappointed because instead of the full-size knife, it was one inch long. <laughs> it was not only fake, it was a miniaturized fake. It was completely useless, right? They got me. It's disappointing 
when we go through life and expect one thing, but we receive another thing. But unfortunately, this happens too often, and it's not limited to things we buy. Unfortunately, people can be fake too. During the school year, I spend a lot of time with teenagers, and I often hear about the drama between friends, and one of the worst accusations a friend can make to another friend is that they are, quote, fake, right? This friend, they talk bad about me behind my back. They act nice, but then they're really mean to me behind the scenes, right? They're fake. Our scripture reading this morning is Jesus dealing with a group of people who he says, y'all are fake. You appear to be righteous. You appear like you have everything together, but you're actually far from God. These people are the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the scribes, the experts in Jewish religion. They know every detail of the Jewish law. Now, if you were to sit down and and read through the Old Testament and begin counting, how many laws, how many rules are there in the Old Testament? It turns out that there are 613 commandments. And the Pharisees, if you were to ask them, they could list every single one of them. But not only that, the the Pharisees had this school of thought that they, they began interpreting those laws and expanding them and applying them to more areas of life. So the Pharisees actually added to the 613. The Pharisees had an additional 1,500 laws that they followed, right? They, they were experts in legalism, in laws. The careful Pharisee could say that he kept every law, both the ones God gave and the ones man made. Throughout the Gospels, the Pharisees are portrayed as people who believed they were perfect, But despite this perfection, it's interesting to note that Jesus is harder on the Pharisees than on any other people group, right? Jesus, nowhere in the the Bible does Jesus rebuke the the Gentiles, the the Romans, right? At no point does Jesus really have anything too strong to say to the tax collectors or the prostitutes or the the various sinners that he meets. He he calls them to repentance, but he's not overly harsh. But, But the Pharisees... Jesus rebukes them strongly. And our scripture reading today is a portion of the strongest rebuke that Jesus gives to the Pharisees from Matthew 23. Matthew 23, if you begin reading it, it goes through seven statements of a behavior the Pharisees, that they were guilty of doing, and then the condemnation of Jesus of like what the implication of that was. Scholars call these things the seven woes, because basically he says, woe to you for doing these things, right? Seven statements. The Pharisees were entrusted to be guardians of the faith, of the Jewish faith. Their their responsibility was to open the way to heaven to people, to help people understand how to, to live a faithful life. But rather than helping sinners find God's grace, they crushed people under legalistic burdens, They made it seem like God was unknowable and inaccessible. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, You should practice and obey what the Pharisees tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. Jesus uses a word, that is common in our contemporary church vocabulary to describe what the Pharisees were doing. He says that you all, Pharisees, they're hypocrites. Hypocrites. I was reading a study recently, and it was looking at what, why did people who at one point attended church, why did they stop going to church? And and 30% of people who no longer attend a church say that the reason that they don't go to church is because the church is so filled of Hypocrites. Hypocrites. Being called a hypocrite is a weighty accusation. It's important to take a look at exactly what a hypocrite is, what it is not, and then examine our own hearts to make sure that we are following the path of disciples rather than becoming Pharisees. The word hypocrite comes from a Greek word that means pretender. It was primarily used as a word to describe someone who is an actor. So if you were a Greek speaker in today's world, you might say, my favorite hypocrite was John Wayne. Yes, the Duke. He was not really a no-nonsense cowboy, right? He, he was pretending to do that. 
James Earl Jones is not really Darth Vader, and Tom Cruise is neither a super spy nor uh, a crack fighter pilot, though he's really good at acting, right? It becomes almost believable whenever you're watching the films that this person who is pretending to do this thing, is might, they might actually be that. Hypocrisy is great for Hollywood, but it is a terrible attribute for a Christian. A Christian hypocrite pretends to be a Christian but their religion is purely superficial. The Pharisees of Jesus' day, they looked, go- they looked good on the outside. They appeared to be like the beautiful waterfall in China. But when you looked at their hearts, they were all dried up. A hypocrite is not simply someone who goes to church and then sins throughout the week. You know, one of the things that whenever someone says, they kind of misapply the word hypocrite. It doesn't mean like, I went to church and I'm doing my best, but at some point along my week, I messed up and someone saw me and they're like, how could you do that? I saw you at church on Sunday, right? You're such a hypocrite. But the reality is everyone in the church is a sinner. As far as I know, the church is the only human institution in the world that requires, like one of the requirements for joining the church is like admitting that we're sinners, right? Everyone has to do that to receive God's grace and then to to be a member of the church. So that's not what hypocrisy is. But hypocrisy, it's whenever you act like you're perfect. It's whenever you think you're perfect. It's whenever you condemn others for not being as good as you are. And it's uh, whenever they begin placing barriers between others and receiving God's grace. The worst part about being a hypocrite is that usually the hypocrite is completely unaware that something is wrong. It is far easier for me to recognize someone else being a hypocrite than it is for me to realize when I am being a hypocrite. Christianity is meant to be a religion of the heart. It is an interior transformation through the Holy Spirit that results in outward changes. But the hypocrite doesn't experience the inward change. They're Their religion is is on the surface only. When they go through a time of testing, they begin crumbling because they have no foundation. Their hearts are rotten underneath the surface. Recently, I was doing some repair work at my house, and I was going around the outside, and I noticed some paint peeling away. And so I walk over, and I begin to touch it, try to see what was going on. And whenever I touched the wall, my finger went straight through. It was completely rotten under the surface. And what had happened was the previous owner of my house had, had maybe seen that it was a little damaged, and they decided to just paint it over. And, and they did a good job of painting because, like, the home inspector didn't find it. No one noticed this until, until a year and a half into me owning the house. And now I have to do this major renovation project where I begin peeling off the siding because the wood siding is completely rotten. It had to be totally replaced on that side of the house. In the same way... For the hypocrite to be restored, they must surrender their whole hearts to God and acknowledge their need for grace. Sometimes you have to pull out the whole thing in order for it to be repaired. But a, but a hypocrite is like that, that rotten piece of wood. Hypocrisy is one of the most deadly of sins in the Christian life because it begins, it causes you to trust in something that is counterfeit. It builds a false sense of confidence. Jesus says that the hypocrite is like a whitewashed tomb. And I was looking for pictures of whitewashed tombs, and this was like the prettiest mausoleum that I could find, right? This is a a beautiful building, an expensive building. It's got these great columns and these fancy doors, but but it's the same as a pile of dirt in the, you know, where a person's buried in the ground. It's, It's a place to hold someone's bones, right? It's a place of death. A hypocrite might look beautiful on the outside, but the inside is filled with death. So what's the difference between a hypocrite and someone with genuine faith? One of the first things is is that a hypocrite, there's a disconnect between what they say and what they do. The hypocrite lives an inconsistent life. They, They act one way at church and another way at home with their family, or another way at work, or another way when they're out in public. That's not to say you will always be perfect, But if you're kind and gracious only one hour a week and the rest of the time you're an emotional monster, chances are you're a hypocrite, right? We're called to to work and to strive toward a life of consistency. And, And consistency can be a big challenge, right? 
For me, it is easy. Whenever I'm sitting in my office and listening to a person pour out their hearts and something that they're struggling with, it is so easy for me to show grace in that moment. It is another thing entirely whenever I'm driving down 278. I drive across 278 from Ridgeland every day, every day. And, and, and most of the time, I, I, I wait to put on my collar till I get to the parking lot. <laughs> I'm not joking because I'm afraid of what, what my testimony is whenever I'm driving. <laughs> I've got a little hypocrisy to work on, I think. We choose... Throughout our lives, we make a choice how we interact with other people. We, we blame a lot of things on, like, I just have an anger problem, but a, that's just an excuse for the choices we make. We have a choice to show grace or harshness. We have a choice to show compassion or hard-heartedness. And these choices, the quality of our witness, these choices determine the quality of our witness. I'm going to be very frank. If, if you are a mean person... People are not going to take you seriously whenever you begin talking to them about a God who loves them, right? The choices we make determine the quality of our witness, whether we are a Pharisee or a genuine believer. The second difference between a hypocrite and a genuine believer is is that a hypocrite tends to make excuses. They justify their own actions. They appear to be pious, but they just make excuse after excuse for their behavior, As a result of this, hypocrites struggle to be corrected. Jesus criticizes the Pharisees more than any other group, and most often the Pharisees were just indignant about it. In contrast, a a sincere believer, they have sincerity of heart. This produces an openness to being corrected. The reality is correction and truth hurt. It doesn't matter how mature you are. Whenever someone comes up to you and says, hey, listen, this behavior, this attitude, this action that you are doing is incompatible with the Christian lifestyle, you're like, the first, our first reaction is to be offended by that. But a, true, but a true believer, as you mature in your faith, you're willing to accept that correction and to really take a look to say, wow, maybe, maybe I am living in a way that is contrary to the gospel. The humble person receives godly admonition and is willing to amend their lives. The third distinction, the third contrast, is is that a hypocrite does everything that they do for the praise of other people, whereas the sincere believer seeks to do all that they do for the glory of God. Matthew 23, 5 says, Everything that the hypocrite does is for show. And Jesus explains that they wear extra-wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside. They wear robes and long tassels. It was a common Jewish practice at this time to wear something called a phylactery. And that's a a really like obscure word, but it was a box that contained bits and pieces of scripture. And whenever they would spend time in their prayers in the morning and the evenings, they would take this and they would wrap it around their arm as a physical reminder uh, and a focus that they were praying to God. But the Pharisees, they made theirs like outrageously big compared to everyone else's. And and I can kind of just picture this now. It's like prayer time in the synagogue, and the the Pharisees are like, wow, look, my prayer thingy is bigger than yours, right? (laughs) I'm I'm holier than you. See this? Just check it out, right? I don't know. (laughs) Jesus says this kind of competition, this showy attitude is pointless. If you do things for the glory of man you will receive your temporary, your short-lived reward right here and now. But if you do things for God in secret, you will receive a heavenly reward. The hypocrite rejects the future for the temporary immediate. Finally, and this I think is most significant, the hypocrite has a tendency to cut others off from receiving the grace of God whereas the sincere believer brings people into the presence of God. Few things push people from the faith faster than we make a little thing a big deal. When we embrace a legalistic attitude, we cut both ourselves and others off from God's grace. In verse 13, Jesus says, "'Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, and you yourselves will not enter in.'" 
and you don't let others enter in either. They added unnecessary rules that kept sinners away from God's grace. The modern hypocrite, they think that they can earn God's love, and they think that others have to earn it too, while the true believer receives forgiveness as a gift from God. The Pharisees had reduced the laws of God to a system of works established by the traditions of men. This system was truly overwhelming. I wonder, what legalistic things do we add and thus push people away today? Mm. Ultimately, the hypocrite creates a legalistic system because they believe they have to earn God's grace, that they have to earn His love, they have to earn His favor. They embrace rules that are not found in the Bible and expect others to live by those rules too. But the Bible is clear. We cannot earn our salvation by being good. There is nothing in this world that you can do, no act, no deed too good to earn your salvation. The point of the Old Testament law in all of its legalism, according to Paul, it was to crush our self-confidence. It was to say, look, the law is so big that there's no way that a human being can, can do this on their own. It was, to, it was there to inspire us to flee to the cross of Jesus. Legalism may soothe our conscience for a moment if we do it well. It may make us feel proud or religious. It might even make us feel better than other people. But if we think we can earn our salvation based on what's on the outside of our lives, we will be disappointed because this outward righteousness, it puts all of the pressure on me for my performance or on you. As we seek to add these layers of legalism to us, we think, if only I could be a little bit better, maybe I can claw myself into heaven. But the gospel says it doesn't matter what you do. Salvation is a free gift of God that comes whenever we respond in our hearts with faith faith, and then we receive grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It's not something we earn. It's not something we can, we can grasp for ourselves. It is a free gift of God. And friends, if that doesn't excite you, if that makes you a little nervous, it's very common. A legalist gets nervous by grace. Then maybe we haven't encountered that grace yet. And maybe now's the moment in our hearts to say, Lord, I want that kind of freedom the freedom to know your love, the freedom to be filled with your grace, the freedom to not have to strive anymore, the freedom to receive. The true believer has had an encounter with God's grace. The hypocrite pulls people away from God's grace. The true believer wants to open the gates of heaven, wants to welcome these folks into the church. They highlight the words of Jesus himself. This is what Jesus said, come to me. All who are weary, who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, said Jesus, for I am humble and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Come to Jesus because his kingdom is open wide. The curtain of the temple has been torn in two from top to bottom. The, the, the way is open to heaven. And today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Come to Jesus. Let him forgive your sins. Allow your hearts to be softened by his grace. As I bring my message to a close, I have a couple of things that I hope do not happen today. Number one, I don't want this sermon to inspire worry. Worry about your salvation. Worry that you are a hypocrite. Because ultimately, if, if you have the humility to realize you aren't where God wants you to be, then you're not a hypocrite. Secondly, I hope that no one walks out of here thinking, wow, did you see how many hypocrites were at church today? <laughs> That's not the intended. I'm, this is not a finger pointing time. If you are disillusioned by the hypocrisy you have seen in the church, if you have been wounded by the church in the past, don't give up. The church is a hospital for the sick, a place for the broken, and that means the hypocrites too. Be patient with them as Jesus does a healing work in their hearts. 
May today be a day where we ask God to give us his amazing grace, where he converts all of our hearts from from insincerity to sincerity. Let's move beyond the fake, and let's be real. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for for your love and grace. Lord, I thank you that it doesn't matter if I am a good person or a bad person, that you are not a respecter of persons, but you are here to invite all of us to receive your grace, to receive your love. And I pray, God, that right now, every single one of us will open our hearts to receive more of you, that you would speak to us and that we would lay down the fake, that we would embrace being real in front of you. We praise you and we thank you, Lord. Amen. Let us stand and respond through song.